Okay, so let's see. Can you guys see me clearly? Oh, let me turn on the light first. All right, so let's get started. Today's uh, topic is whole brain imaging, uh, the second. Um, I, uh, I added one slide for those who may be, it's a little unclear for MRI last class T1 and T2. So these are like edit slide, I will put this one as an updated, just add one slide for you guys. Um, so this is uh, when we give external RF, then it will go back to the longitudinal component. Regrow is a related T1 relaxation and the transfers and it over time it will like diffuse out, deface, and that deface on the transverse X direction is T2. So this is just for your uh, reference and I'm gonna move on. T2 edema, that's what you remember and T1 provides a more clear contrast. So they can be used as an anatomical background image for many. All right, so today uh, we will continue our functional imaging techniques, including PET, SPECT, EEG, MEG, and optical imaging. And these techniques can be used to investigate necessity and sufficiency of a specific brain region connected to a specific brain function. And at the end, I will also try to uh, explain an emerging uh, techniques, so-called transcranial magnetic stimulation, ultrasound neuro neuromodulation. Okay, and one thing I want to emphasize today is, you know, you have many questions in each kind of slide. I always try to put slide number. So slide page and quick questions, whenever you raise something because my pace can be a little fast. And from time to time, I go back to try to answer your question right away. In addition to your burning question at the end of the class for maybe one, uh, your uh, big questions, which will be used for Q&A session. All right, before getting, I added this slide to make it clear for you to understand uh, about this uh, spectrum uh, electromagnetic radiation for those who may have a little, uh, uh, little background. So you guys already know that electromagnetic radiation has a wavelength, okay? And that we know that what we can see our visible uh, range is very, very limited. So that we call visible light. It's only about 400 to 700 nanometer, okay? But there are so much of different uh, wavelength. Here we are especially interested in more high powerful photons, which will have a shorter wavelength, such as UV light, which causes our skin cancer, act, uh, many lesions in the skin, and then soft X-rays, hard X-rays, and gamma rays, we will cover this. And you know from the, <coughs> from the basic physics, that shorter wavelengths corresponds to higher uh, photon energy. And that relation is this. Uh, we use it electron volt. In fact, this is energy equals charge times electric potential. E equals QV. And that range is a Q is in one electron uh, 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 electric charge and V is a voltage. So what I want to point out is in these hard X-rays, you can see 10, we call CAF, kilo electron volt is used for crystallography, you know, mammography for this and medical CT. As just Kohiner pointed out, it uses a very strong uh, photon energy. So it can be, uh, you know, a lot of exposure, but you want to find out something more, in, more uh, uh, important, uh, overcoming that risk. And also you, when you pass through uh, airport, you see these ones are being using pretty uh, strong uh, you know, energy photons of X-ray. And even stronger one is 
gamma ray, you see the picometer range of wavelength. It's very, very, very small, uh, short wavelength. So how we define X-ray as a 10 nanometer to 10 picometer as X-ray, while even shorter than that, which is more powerful is gamma ray. So less than 10 picometer, which is 10 to the minus 11. You know, this is smaller than the size of hydrogen atom. Okay, smaller than one angstrom. Okay, then the photon energy, while wavelength is smaller, the energy is higher. So it's why X-rays less than 100 kF, gamma rays higher than 100 kF. I'll get back to this a little bit later. So all these, you can actually, as a homework, like home exercise, you can convert this wavelength into photon energy by the famous uh, Einstein's E equals ha nu. We can have Planck constant frequency can be linked to photon energy, all right? Okay, let's move on. I want to discuss about PET, which is posturant emission tomography. And you can see a very, very simple diagram that hey, posturant goes out and it somehow hits the nearby atoms electron and what happens is these, you know, you know Einstein's a mass contains a lot of energy and they will disappear. The mass disappears and what happens? The energy remains and energy has to come out. And interestingly, you see this uh, both direction. In physics, basic physics, you learn about a uh, momentum conservation. Okay, if the momentum has conserved to one photon's going this way, it's actually gamma ray there's opposite the same photon come out because there's no net momentum. So that's very interesting physical phenomena. And we use exactly this to find out the location of when this annihilation happened, how we have like detectors in the opposite side. And you see this detector and detector, they will measure this photon arrival time and they measure the differences in this time. And that's the key. And you see how poor the uh, image is? This is the image. Very, very poor. However, this is very precious, okay? So what the contrast is, uh, we use unstable positron emitting isotope, radio isotope, which we typically inject into the carotid artery uh, to see inside the brain. So I'm going to ask you some questions like, uh, so this is called positron, which is a counterpart of an electron with different charge. Uh, Jibam, can you guess what this is? Yes, professor. Yeah. Can you guess what this? Uh, I don't know that. Okay. Yeah, that's right. It's actually antimatter. So it's in the physics. Uh, contact with an electron and when I ask something, the answer is usually somewhere nearby. Jibam again, can you guess what that is? Uh, an annihilation? Yes, it's called annihilation. Yes, it's called annihilation. In Korean, it's a sang somyeol. Okay, so yeah, it's a little difficult uh, spelling, but the answer is here. Um, and and why, why I'm telling you this, this uh, disappearance of this two mass will generate photons and resulting in a pair of G photons in opposite direction. Uh, Julie, can you guess what this is? This is a gamma photon. Exactly, the answers are not that far. This is a very powerful photon, okay? That's why this passed through all the brain, okay? Okay, so let me go to a little more detail into the pad. So you see a human body and we inject this gamma radio isotope as a molecular probe, which means this isotope will somehow attach to specific molecules. And I'm interested in the location of this molecule to be accumulated. And what happened? You see, look at this. These are single, each of this rod is in fact a very expensive a photon detector, okay? So when it goes, 
positron hits the electron, they somehow disappear, so-called annihilation, and powerful gamma rays goes back and forth in the opposite direction, and you detect the time of arrival, and you compare the differences in time. And why you are doing this is because of the, if the time here and here is, let's say, one nanosecond, two nanosecond, the difference is two, one nanosecond, then you know from the center how, how closer this point is, would be. So this way, you can have a two-dimensional a location map of this event to happen. So that, how about we can uh, measure 3D? Hey, you see this four layer. So in Z direction, we can even measure by finding out the exact opposite detector for tonal arrival time. So it's a very simple in, in effect. So for example, radio isotope, typically C12, now it's C11, so it will soon decay. And, and while doing this, it, uh, it generates a positron, and that positron will actually wander around from its original location. It's wander around, and, and nearby you know, tissue, nearby atom, electron, hit the electron. So the event of this happening is not exactly the original location of this radio isotope. This is very important to understand. And the distance from this to this is about like about millimeter or 1.7 millimeter. Okay. That's why PET has a poor spatial resolution. Okay. So let me go further. So gamma photons pass through the body and can be measured by gamma detecting device that circles the subject head. And Look at a few seconds, time difference determines the location. Okay, so what this means is you know the speed of the light is three times 10 to the eight meter per second. You can calculate at home if the time difference, let me see, if the time difference is, let's say, one, uh, three nanosecond, let's say, which is possible to measure electronics. Our electronics can measure about nanosecond order. Three nanosecond corresponds to one meter. So we can measure 0.3 nanosecond that corresponds to one centimeter so that we can have this resolution by using electronics. So that's nice. A few nanosecond time difference we can measure and you can Go back to look at this is about one meter diameter and we can use our electronics to measure the time difference uh, about one nanosecond order that gives us a good enough resolution. Okay, but you remember your cell phone has a 2.4 gigahertz and that gigahertz means in, in, in the other way, it's a nanosecond or 0.1 nanosecond. Or that's what our electronics can measure right now. What about the faster one, like picosecond? We cannot measure with our electronics. We have to have a physical tricks to measure those. Okay. So gamma photon is other words, gamma radiation, or this is really strong, so it penetrates all throughout all the body. Uh, that's why we call it gamma ray too. It's ionizing radiation from gamma decay. I said wavelength is less than 10 picometer and the energy is a few hundred cap. So here, typically when we use this one, the energy of one gamma ray is 512 cap. So another 512 cap is coming out with this one event. So what are we use uh, with this PET agent? Look at this. Hey, this is a very poor image. As I said before, spatial resolution is limited by the, the original location of isotope until the annihilation event, which it, this positron has to hit the nearby electron. And that distance is about one to two millimeter away. So you cannot have better than this several millimeter resolution. That's why this is so poor. 
However, it provides a very important precious information. That is molecular information. So we use PET contrast agent. So for example, new tau tracer, what that means is, you know, Alzheimer's disease, one of the big cause of Alzheimer's disease, we consider it as a tau protein. So we can make this radio isotope to specifically attach tau so that it reveals the amount of tau in our brain as distribution. Then we can have a healthy control. We inject it and we find the Alzheimer's disease showing in some specific brain region, it has high. And also in middle, we call, actually I put it here, MCI stands for in between, before AD, mild cognitive impairment. It shows kind of in intermediate. So what it means is this, is, this PET probe may be used for diagnosing Alzheimer's disease or beforehand mild cognitive impairment. So this is such a very precious information which normal structural MRI would not be able to tell us. Okay, so positron emission isotopes, which isotope means a variant of particle chemical element which differ in uh, mean some. You're a chemist, so like in one a nucleus, uh, we are explaining isotope with different one number. Can you guess? Neutron. Exactly, neutron number with the same number of? Proton. Exactly, protons in each atom. So one example is I want you to at least get to know FDG is so famous PET contrast agent. What it means is fluorodeoxyglucose. This is the analog of glucose. What it means, you know, our brain cell neuron needs a lot of glucose to work. Our heart needs a lot of glucose. So what we use this one to, to exactly uh, being uptaken by brain or heart or in pathology, cancer cells love glucose. So this is a radioactive form of glucose and metabolically active neurons in neuroscience require an increase in the uptake of glucose from the blood. So that presence of FDG as an indirect good marker of neural activity. So this is a very important like counterpart of functional MRI in PET we give this before giving the animal or human to do any task. Let's say I have to do a do math problem. I'm curious about which part of the brain is related to the math ability. I inject this die and then ask me to for 30 minutes solving math problem. And then I put myself into the pet and showing a part of the brain, this can be a good screening test. Which part of our brain can be related to when I do analytic mathematical uh, task. Okay. So what are the merits and demerits of PET imaging? The important part, even poor resolution, this is very important to giving metabolism of specific bioactive molecules, such as neurotransmitters. And an example is relative metabolism of serotonin, uh, in human brain, by use of radioactive ligand that binds to serotonin receptor. So this is related to a reward uh, system. So, you know, this pad allows us to do a functional imaging. So what's the limitation? Hey, to do this calculation, it's temporal resolution is about several seconds. So it's, it's not like very fast technique. And then as I said, spatial resolution is poor. So in general, we can have about four millimeter. From what I know, when we were considering, we actually have an animal pet in our school, which is over a million dollars. It's very rare in the world that without hospital having micro pet, this is absolutely very good equipment to do a specific interesting study. And that animal pet may have about two millimeter resolution. Okay. so. Unfortunately, PET do not provide a nice anatomy as you saw that. So we often combine with anatomical imaging techniques such as CT or MRI. In our school, we have 
micropath CT combination equipment. I hope you guys can enjoy uh, at least to take a tour or having a chance to know what those uh, provide us. And but it has a high cost because radio isotope is used. Um, PET uses a very uh, good quality, I mean, a specific isotope that must be synthesized using cyclotron device, which is a big equipment, which we don't have in GIST, only in the hospital. And for example, the nearby Jeonnam National Hospital um, Nuclear Medicine Department has it. So a typical, uh, uh, the most widely used is uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, has a half-life of less than two hours. So what happens? How do we do experiment in GIST using this? Hey, I want to use this one for, let's say, some specific uh, neural activity localization study. Then we have to ask nearby hospital to do a quick service. So they generate with cyclotron, they send it quick, and then come here and we have probably about an hour left to do our experiment. So this is how things work. Okay. And we have to inject this radioactive substance into the uh, subject. Okay. We have to inject. Okay. So this is a uh, kind of uh, requirement for, we need a specific radiochemical uh, space and a cyclotron. We buy it in ourselves. For example, these examples of short-lived PET radioisotope is we use uh, F18 um, that has about 110 minutes. But what about in some other cases, I want to use a uh, carbon 11 and half-life. Half-life means uh, the time when it decays inside our body, uh, when it, the amount becomes concentration become half. The time is, look at only 20 minutes. Nitrogen 13, only 10 minutes. Oxygen, forget about it. It's only two minutes. You have to be nearby cyclotron. Otherwise, you can't do the experiment using this. Okay. Now I want to uh, move on. So this is why PET is so expensive, but it's precious. But we, we need some other alternative, a cheaper alternative. So that's actually spec. So it's a single photon emission and CT is the same CT, meaning that we are generating tomography with this. Um, so let me show you this uh, CT, a SPECT scanner. You see a patient, uh, many times we use it for heart. Someone suffers from heart problem or heart um, cardiac accident, such as Shinjangmabi. Uh, myocardial infarction, we want to find out what are the viable portion of the, the, uh, the, the heart. As I said, heart is using a lot of glucose. So you inject it and you see this is a gamma camera and the gamma rays are coming out. We have two gamma camera here. We can rotate with a multiple angle. We can create a 2D 2D uh, cross-sectional view. Look at this. This part of the heart, in fact, is the place where it suffers from ischemia and that the tissue might not be viable. Depending on the viability of this, the doctors may decide, hey, this is completely dead, or this is still viable. We may want to do some procedure to revive this part. And, and so this is a very also specific and very precious technique. So this gamma decay is a high energy nucleus falling down to lower energy state and emits gamma photon. So, and this is, I already told you, so I'm gonna move on. And I'm gonna show a little different geometry of this gamma camera versus PET, the difference. Gamma as a camera, you see this is camera, okay? Have multiple pixels simultaneously. Uh, you see the, problem which can happen is this gamma photons can scatter, then you cannot have a clear localization, okay? And this photon is so strong that we need to have a collimator made out of lead, very high, uh, heavy uh, metal. Uh, so this is gamma camera, while PET 
is a detector circularly, and that is a point by point uh, uh, detectors. So that's how it's a little different. So SPECT is a cheaper alternative. What are the similarities to PADIS? It's also functional images of neural activity. It doesn't provide structural data and radioisotope has to be injected or inhaled into the circulatory system and the probe binds to red blood cell to be carried out throughout the body and neural met metabolism can be detected from this radioactive signal. The big difference, we are using a camera, a specific camera called gamma camera. What's the difference with the pad? It's not as expensive. As I say, that detector of PET, we actually use a photo multiplier too, which is even one is several hundred dollars and we are using hundreds of them. So that's why PET is so expensive compared to the uh, SPEC. So, uh, and also uh, SPEC is, the SPEC probe is not as expensive because it uses cheaper isotope probes and that do not require on-site cyclotron. And so inspect that tracer itself directly generates, it decays, it directly generates gamma rays, while PET requires what? Positron. Okay. So that's the, the comparison of SPECT and PET. Uh, and I, I think I put this one for your information. Okay. How does gamma camera looks like? And so you look at this body, um, there is a collimator uh, and there's a pipe, there's a, or not also PMT tubes, not as many as PET and that PMT or photon multiplier tube. Why photon? Because we have a crystal. You know, gamma rays are so strong. If you put any a camera there, it will pass through and it will saturate your pixel, even damage your pixel. And we use a specific crystal that converts this gamma energy into the light. So that is called scintillation. And we use detect PMT to detect the light and then we provide a 2D image. And how does this collimator look like? This is collimator look like. You know, the gamma rays so powerful that we only want the rays like parallel to this. So oblique ones, we have to stop it. So we use a lead, not very heavy, heavy metal to block the other so that only the, the rays, which is a parallel can penetrate so that the location cannot be mixed up. So this is a way we use collimator uh, for collimating gamma ray in gamma camera. And the conversion of this uh, gamma ray into the photon, we call it as a scintillation. Uh, meaning it's a flash of light, okay? Okay, that's a, a reference. And with this gamma camera, spatial resolution is even poor. It's all, almost about a centimeter, okay? And, but, you know, all these are very high sensitive, which means detect a nanogram of this radioisotope specificity. Uh, it has also high specificity because there's no natural radioactivity typically. Uh, so this is another view of gamma camera. So we can rotate gamma camera around human subject or brain in this case, so that we can create three dimensional map as well. So planar gamma detect, you see this collimator now, and we are like, we can rotate, we can take one, two, three imaging of head, and we can have a parallel hole, collimators, and multiple views by rotating this imaging around the subject. So because of that geometry, we have relatively poor spatial resolution, but it's precious functional imaging is provided. Radioactive substance has to be also injected. Okay, so I've, I've spent time pad and spec. Uh, a few have questions on slides you may them in chat. Okay, so whenever you have a question, I think you can go. And I'm going to move on to next. EEG. 
electroencephalogram. Electro is about you know electron, a uh, 전기, and encephalo means a uh, brain. Okay, and gram means graph. It's it's a picture. Okay, so this is how like typical. Maybe this is 64 electro. Depending on the number of this probe will determine spatial resolution. And because of all this one, we can measure this electrical potential over time. You see, these are typical EEG or in Korean, 뇌파, okay? And that's very complicated, so it's not easy to uh, interpret. So the example is a human subject wearing electrodes for EEG recording. You know, some neuroscience laboratory actually using only having one or two EEG probe into the insert into the brain. That's good enough to find out the animal for asleep or awake, okay? Uh, but for human, let's say we have a lot more, so having a better spatial resolution in this case. So what is EEG? Is a, a measure of gross electrical activity of the surface of the brain. Notice we put electrode on the scalp, on the surface. We are not measuring deep inside the brain. It's very hard to measure. So, so because of that, it's not maybe truly a brain imaging technique, one can say, but the very positive aspect is non-invasive. And oops, I have a wrong, to ascertain particular state of consciousness with a temporal resolution. Hey, sorry, this answer is already there. And why millisecond is the EEG's temporal resolution? Because our brain activity, you guys all have learned about action potential of a neuron. The timing of the action potential is about one millisecond. That's why EEG also measures uh, as fast as millisecond. We can combine with fMRI, we can have a better spatial temporal resolution of neural activity. However, let me explain how we can measure neural activity. That's tiny neurons inside the brain. Uh, how can you measure very far outside with just measuring electrical activity that's very, very weak and high noise. Uh, but that we can have an analysis. This I just put it a uh, picture. It's a New York Times, okay? There are many people out there then what we have is we have a loud speaker, uh, microphone in the orbit, like satellite. You cannot hear New York Times sound. However, hey, this is New Year's Day. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, one. Yay! Everyone all together. Then even that far away, you can actually hear it. This is how EEG works. EEG cannot measure a single neuron's random activity, but coordinated all sorts of neurons like fire together. And that can be measured by EEG. You have to understand that physics. So uh, EEG cannot record electrical activity from a single neuron, but can ascertain when a meaningful event occurs in the brain. So that's the point I want to make with EEG. So this is just reference. For example, I'm interested in what happens in human or when he, human subject hears the sound. And we measure EEG probe. So we amplify, you see these uh, event. EEG, in fact, is we have stimulated one time. This is what you actually see. Wow, complicated. Second, wow, complicated. Third, wow, and n time. You have to do many, many times. And you average this out because there, this has a poor signal to noise ratio. In the end, you get something meaningful one. Okay, for example, is this. So in this sound, auditory nerves may um, happen within millisecond and pre-attentive respond. And people say, hey, we cognitively uh, respond to this sound. That happens in 300 milliseconds after this event happens. So people pay attention to this is an important indicator of what the subject cognitively uh, uh, like listen to something event is happening. Okay, so that's how people using EEG
do study. So you have to repeat many times and average to get the mean for one. Okay, so that application of EEG is we call ERP. Uh, let me see. Uh, Shukla, can you guess what this is? Can you guess? In, in event-related potentials. Exactly, very good. So event-related potential. So that's what we call event, and then the potential change we see both in human and animal. So it's a distinct stereotype waveform in EEG that corresponds to a specific sensory, cognitive, or moral event. That's why it's ERP. So in this way, it is provides a, a very good thing. Even we can use it easily for human because it's non-invasive uh, means of evaluating brain function in experimental subject or patient with even cognitive disease. Hey, maybe Alzheimer's disease patient may not be giving a, a, a nice cognitive response, something like that. We may be using this for, let's say, diagnosis, uh, or the status of the patient. So now I want to move on to another, uh, another uh, modality of functional imaging. So look at our brain cross section called corona section. And let's look inside here. This is cortex and there are pyramidal cells, which is uh, lying in uh, several layers of brain, which is specific pyramidal shape, and very strong um, electrical, relatively strong electrical activity happens when it does a neural activity. So let me see this, and there is a synapse, and action potential generate, and you know, charge movement is called current. And you guys all remember, current goes and surrounding magnetic field is generated, right? This magnetic field is what we are interested. So let's say, so tiny electrical activity or action potential passing, you can consider it as a tiny, small, induced current. And when current happens, there the magnetic field generates. So the idea is, hey, can you measure this magnetic field change? Okay, so that's the basic idea of called magnetoencephalography, called MEG, magnetoencephalo brain graph showing. And we measure magnetic fields naturally generated by neuronal sources in the brain. So how does it look? This is like this helmet with a tiny, tiny magnetic field sensors are attached. And, and this is how it look. The cool thing about this is not like MRI, the patient can sit down because it's like helmet. But we are measuring tiny magnetic field. It needs a very good shielded room. It is an extremely expensive device that I guess in Korea, uh, maybe a couple within the whole Korea, even in the US, not like a lot, okay? So magnetic fields are naturally generated uh, by neuronal sources in the brain, just as I explained. So we measure the change of magnetic fields on the surface of the scalp that are produced by changes in the underlying patterns of neural electrical activity. The good thing is this is very, very sensitive. The other part is this is very, very expensive. Okay, here's an example from MGH. Activity before movement, during, uh, just after movement, you see this uh, motor area of the brain, the signal shows up. So what are the features of magnetoencephalography is now even smaller number of neurons such as 50,000 neurons are required to produce a detectable signal. Compared with the EEG, EEG needs millions of neurons shouting simultaneously. 
compared MEG only 50,000. So maybe, so it's, a, a, it's more sensitive and spatial resolution is better, such as about one millimeter for MEG, one centimeter for E. Remember, you see this probe in the human, that distance is about one centimeter order, okay? And MEG also uses a, a magnetic field sensor and it measures with the electronics, so it has a better temporal resolution compared to other uh, reconstruction-based PET, SPEC, and fMRI. Uh, so we can combine with the fMRI, then maybe we can compensate temporal and spatial resolution together with neural activity. But as I said, it's the sensor it's very expensive and you need completely shield the room for any electrical and magnetic disturbance. So application of MEG is event related. Now it's not potential, but we are measuring magnetic field. Okay, so it's event related field. Okay. All right, so I finished MEG and EEG. If you have question, uh, I think you can write down uh, your question in the chatting room. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to another aspect, optics. So, can we use a light to probe neural activity inside the brain? The answer is yes. However, there are limitations we have to understand. Because light, as you see me, you don't see inside of me because of the light scattering do not allow myself as a transparent, okay? So that's a light scattering or photon interaction with the tissue, biological tissue. And you look at this, DOT stands for diffuse optical tomography, NHD means a high definition. And very interesting, you guys remember fMRI can show up a visual cortex on the backside of your uh, brain and motor network and frontal parietal on the side, control network and default mode network means uh, this is so-called a functional connectivity when you are like doing nothing, the brain area are actually working pretty like, it looks random but actually they are connected. So that's called default mode network. And you look at this fMRI data and the Washington University people, um, when they built this optical, diffuse optical tomography with high, many, many numbers of detectors and what they found, look at that diffuse optics, actually they look almost similar to fMRI. So that's why it came out to uh, Nature Photonics in 2014, showing that, hey, even optical imaging may be similar to fMRI. However, this one is only surface of the brain, not deep inside, you have to understand that. And what about, I want to study memory, and then memory we know as important hippocampus, which is underneath the cortex, and optics, do not allow to see hippocampus in high resolution. So what the brutal force, this is done by Mark Schnitzer's group at Stanford. Hey, why don't we just take out the cortex on top and then we insert a, a, a rod lens and directly look at this. And I want to have another one for control to be able to say in comparison with baseline or control, I want to show something different. And for this, you need the knowledge of optics, a knowledge of how to pro, uh, do experiment with the animal and image guide and objective. This is uh, this rod lens. And so that you can see neurons underneath the brain. And I added this picture, uh, I'll be posted it again, that you look at this, then now we can have longitudinal imaging day three, day 20, and this is control part, and you put a tumor growing in here, 
and you look at the blood vessel, look at the blood vessel bulges its diameter, it changes its morphology, you can do this in a living animal, in deep inside a brain. So that is possible for functional imaging with the optics. At microscopic scale, and this is more like diffuse, it, does, it has a little poorer resolution, but non-invasive. So, functional optical brain imaging, there's another modality I want to say is optical reflectance imaging, which is imaging neural activity by measuring changes in blood. Um, let me see. Let me say flow and metabolism from the brain. So it detects the changes in light. You shine the light, you actually observe it, you see the reflected photon. So changes in light reflectance from the surface of the brain. And the important thing is, how does these changes in reflectance happen? And that is due to the amount of blood flowing to that particular neural tissue. So we give a stimulus and we take, uh, let's say, treogen. Can you guess what? Before stimulus, we want to take some image, kind of a control. Can you guess what that is? Yeah? It's called baseline images. Baseline is the most important, okay? Without knowing baseline, you will not be able to tell anything. So when you run experiment, control or baseline is the most important, okay? And so that we can compare the changes in reflectance from the baseline. The answer is actually nearby here due to the presentation of a stimulus, okay? So I edit this because, uh, so it's a 2020. Last year, I went to France, Bordeaux. Uh, I did this experiment. So I want to you know, show you a uh, similar thing. So this is optical reflectance imaging. And this is a, a mouse. Uh, we have mouse whisker, which is uh, like this one, okay? So whiskers, very interestingly, having a one-to-one -one correspond to the better cortex, we call it better cortex. So what we did is a single, you know, whisker, we actually poke this one, okay? And then we look at that particular brain region, such as C1, look at it here, C1. We actually touch C1 and see if there is a change in reflectance. D1, hey, this one, another whisker we touch Okay, before and after, we subtract, we got it. You see, you, you see a slight differences in here, actually C1, D1, E1. That's nearby, but not exactly the same location. And this contrast coming from active part of brain uh, changes in blood volume, oxygenation, and light scattering. So it's a kind of mixed up uh, com complex phenomenon. But it, this small changes in reflectance can be detectable from brain surface, which means we have to take out the skull, we have to watch the brain surface directly. However, look at the changes in reflectance, 0.1%. What does that mean? It's one out of a thousand. So very, very tiny changes. That's why you need to have very good background suppression, very good baseline, uh, detection and we have to take multiple images so that this tiny ones can stand out as this. So you need to have image processing for this. What's about spatial resolution? In this case, this is about less than a millimeter and temporal resolution based on this bold MRI, fMRI, blood oxygen level dependent mechanism, it takes several seconds. So. This also has a temporal resolution of several seconds. And what do we use this one for? We can have high resolution, relatively high, functional maps of visual cortex in animals and humans. Uh, in fact, there's a very famous history in this. You know, the cat, which has a very good uh, vision, we show the cat with this horizontal lines and then vertical lines 
fortify the other, and we make this optical reflectance map, what we find is a beautifully sorted a brain area which specifically respond to horizontal line and vertical line and angled line. And so that architecture has been revealed by use of this optical reflectance technique. And what's the limitation? You have to see the brain surface like this. That means you need to take off the scalp. So it's somewhat invasive and brain surface has to be exposed to allow light to penetrate and reflect back to a camera. Okay, so how do we do? Actually, in our department, uh, we actually also have done some, another lab also have done some. So you can have LED with RGB color and you take the scap off of a mouse and you shine this light and then you measure, take pictures. And based on different seed, so blue aspects show this oscillation of deoxyhemoglobin, green, different part of the brain, you can actually generate this. And based on this, what you can have is a, you know, this is pseudo color, though, beautiful representation of olfactory, which is a, you know, smelling part in the frontal, left, right seeds, cingulate seeds, motor seeds, somatosensory, frontal, retrosplenial, visual, which is on the back side, and superior colliculus. So different part of the brain and uh, this area so function can be revealed by this technique. This is so cool. And in the past, we have to remove the scar, but this paper in 2011 by White actually demonstrate even the presence of skull can reveal this. The reason is mouse has a skull, which is very thin. It's about only hundreds of microns. So very thin, almost like you can look through even, okay, somehow. So that, diff uh, I'm going to move on to diffuse optical imaging and near infrared spectroscopy called uh, NIRS, or um, if you use fluorescent, then you can put F. So now we understand light can be useful and even giving functional information. So like we can make a band of light and that has a pair of light source and detector. So what happens is you send the light here and the light will diffuse inside if it's long enough and you detect the light the other location. So source and detector and make a nice pair or arrangement we can actually create somehow like 2D or even potentially semi 3D maps of functional aspect. That's we call diffuse optical. Why we say diffuse? The photons passing through the tissue, if it's a, an order of millimeter, the photon direction is lost, which means like uh, when you shine the light through uh, your uh, finger, you'll see the photons all diffuse. Like uh, you can consider a candle body, okay? Chopul momche, and the light is being diffused. This is a non invasive alternative, uh, but records a light reflectance through this scap. So now we want to generate a technology which can be used for human and non invasive. Then you have to go through the skin of on top of the brain. Okay, the portion of the light is reflected off the brain detected by multiple optrodes or optodes. This is a newly made terminology recently because we talk about electrode, kind of an electrolyte, but we actually use optical fibers for this. So that's a, a combined, a new term jargon that optrode, or just simply we can call optode. What does it do? We can measure the changes in neural activity and that changes the amount of light that is absorbed and reflected by the brain so that we are interested in the function of neural activity. What we actually measure is the reflectance. Obviously, this is indirect measure, okay? All right, so. You know, in a short amount of time, I've gone through many, many different modalities. I know this can be overwhelming to you, but hopefully you understand the core of the physics. 
and I'm going to go through just a little bit because this table in the textbook is not accurate. So I want to point that out too. So, but important thing is when there are modality, which modality you want to use for your own problem. Okay, question. We have to consider spatial resolution. We have to consider temporal resolution. And of course, cost and how invasive it is. fMRI has about a millimeter resolution, several seconds of temporal. Of course, MR is, fMRI uses the same machine as MRI, which is about millions order, several millions. So it's expensive, but we can use it for human, not in it. Spec, uh, PET is about four millimeter resolution. You know, you have to take all the images uh, with radio isotope. It's a, a slow process. It's even more expensive because you have to also buy not only PET machine, the radio isotope. And it's of course, you have to inject this, it's ionizing radiation for detecting cancer or finding out neural activity. You may be okay to take some, you know, some radioactive material. And SPECT is a cheaper version while it has a poorer resolution and the temporal is uh, several seconds. And it's also, of course, gamma camera is still pretty expensive. EEG spatial resolution is about one centimeter, but it's electronics. It measures neural activity. So it's about millisecond time resolution. So cheaper than the other, it's moderate, non-invasive. MEG is a better spatial resolution. And of course, temporal is, it also measures the neural, neuronal, you know, firing activities to so one millisecond. However, that sensor, magnetic field sensor and shielding makes it extremely expensive, okay? Optical imaging here is in the context of functional brain imaging. So it's not exactly the same as microscope. So that's why I put this uh, line there. This is for functional gross brain imaging. So then spatial resolution this. Of course, microscope has a resolution of even micron or submicron level. Temporal resolution for functional brain imaging is the same as based on hemodynamic change. So the temporal is several seconds and it's rather inexpensive compared to the other. But if we want to go more deeper and high resolution, it can be invasive. You may take out scalp, you may take out the scar. Of course, nowadays we want to combine this. For example, PET never uses alone. It has to be combined with CT or MR to provide an anatomical background of functional changes. Okay, all right. So now we talk about imaging and manipulating neural activity for ex experiment. We discuss uh, already loss of function in human. Is it, why is it impossible? What about gain of function in human? So loss of specific part of the brain can be correlated with performance. And that's only possible with a model organism such as animal organism. With the A, uh, I'm sure you know the answer. It's a lesion study. So that's why it's not for human. And that's only possible by finding just by chance, patient lesion from accident or stroke. What about gain of function in human neural functional study? You can stimulate neural activity, particular brain region to improve, determine the performance, improves a task. So for example, uh, for animal, you can have an organic model organism and stimulate with a, some, you insert micro electrode in some brain area, you stimulate certain specific brain area. Okay, that's gain of function potentially. If that, that uh, stimulation will uh, accelerate uh, the firing of a neuron, okay? or you can have a uh, more biological as overly expressing gene, specific gene, which driving activity in a specific population of neurons. So that's a kind of a gain of function experiment, but you can be curious about what about human? Can you do gain of function in human? The answer is yeah, potentially. So by using TMS, 
magnetic stimulation or ultrasound. So we could, let's say, uh, we could stimulate some part of the brain to improve, let's say, hearing for the patients who are suffering from some loss of function. Okay. So I want to cover just a little bit left as a transcranial magnetic stimulation called TMS. And they look like a kepyodagi. Uh, 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 it's like this. Inside, there's a coil in it. And look at this. The current from your electrical uh, magnetism knowledge is that current changes create magnetic field. Okay? So, and that magnetic field, not static, changes the magnetic field, induce a current inside the brain. That is stimulating uh, mechanism, okay? So, so when you actually have this machine, it actually shows like tick, 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 very big sound because of the sudden changes of this, um, it's a current. You have to have changes in current, create magnetic field change that will induce current inside the brain. So this is, however, very interesting, the mechanism is unknown. So it either activates or inactivates regions of human brain. So in the hospital, you know, people, doctors are still using this for treating tinnitus, but they are struggling, hey, why you do this 10 hertz 20 hertz, one hertz, actually some frequencies are stimulating, the other frequencies are inhibiting. So this is a very interesting phenomena. We are still working on that. And that's very, very important for, you know, doing loss of function, gain of function to find the mechanism of how to modulate the neurons. Uh, so a coil is inside, uh, this is a coil and a magnetic field stimulates electrical activity in, it actually is not that deep. Yes, superficial brain. So you don't go like at the middle of the human brain. Okay, hopefully this makes sense. And this is a picture that I want to show some recent uh, researches on this. Um, so one can create a tiny, tiny coil which can, you know that, hey, some people suffer from epilepsy, ganji, okay, uh, okay, and you know this is the focus of epilepsy. If you saw that before accident happened, you give a shock, uh, transcranial magnetic stimulation, that would be great, even with a little bit of a minimally invasive way. So this is the study, depending on strength of magnetic field and region, this electrical activity can cause temporal loss of function or gain of function. For example, epilepsy is like exciting, like crazy excitation. You want to stop it inhibitory, okay? But this problem is it's limited outer surface of the brain. So there were nature communication paper. You make this tiny magnet insert right inside the brain location where you know what that is. That's the place of focus of epilepsy. You want to suppress it when necessary. Uh, but it's done only for animal, not for human, okay? So that's why in the future, it's a potential therapeutic treatment of disease in the treatment of depression or motor disease. And the, at the last one, I want to introduce an ultrasound um, neuromodulation. Okay, so ultrasound, Unlike others, ultrasound has a pretty longer wavelength. As you know, your sound wave has a longer wavelength. What it means is it suffers less from scattering loss. So ultrasound can go deep inside your belly, showing pregnant woman's baby. That's several centimeters down. So that's a pretty good aspect. However, uh, skull is a big hurdle for ultrasound. But ultrasonic neuromodulation is an emerging field that you can do functional ovulation with high energy focus. You can delete, you can destroy some part. So now operation and gene therapy, 
you can use ultrasound disturbed cell membrane, you can insert the external gene. You can stimulate brain, you can have sonothrombolysis. What it means is, hey, if we find a stroke, a blood clot is happening in some, and you can use ultrasound to disturb and resolve that blockage of the blood vessel sonothrombolysis. This is still its infancy, stem cell dynamics, nerve regeneration can be done, blood-brain barrier disruption. The big problem of brain is you can insert, you can deliver a good drug into the brain, so-called parenchyma, just because the brain has a self barrier called blood-brain barrier. You can't allow chemical getting into the brain easily. But by using ultrasound to disturb this brain barrier temporarily, you can deliver helpful drugs. So that's another active area. So a non-invasive treatment of brain disorder, this is an emerging area. The interesting thing is we do not know yet why ultrasound can do stimulate or inhibit. The mechanism is not completely understood. All right, so that's, I think, what I say. Uh, I want to just uh, say here, both thermal and non-thermal, which is a mechanical mechanism, ultrasound has been shown to exert numerous bio effect on brain tissue that provides a basis for non-invasive. It's great in non-invasive therapy for neurological or psychiatric disorders. Okay, but the big hurdle for human is the presence of scar. Okay, 